Chapter Twelve of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve, The Rendezvous. The day after he had confided the Goualeuse to the care of Madame Georges, Rodolph, still dressed as a mechanic, was at noon precisely at the door of a cabaret with the sign of the Panier Fleuri, not far from the barrier of Bercy the evening before at ten o'clock the chourineur was punctual to the appointment which rodolph had fixed with him the result of this narrative will inform our readers of the particulars of the meeting it was twelve o'clock and the rain fell in torrents the seine swollen by perpetual falls of rain had risen very high and overflowed a part of the quay rodolph looked from time to time with a gesture of impatience towards the barrier and at last observed a man and woman who were coming towards him under the shelter of an umbrella and whom he recognized as the chouette and the schoolmaster these two individuals were completely metamorphosed the ruffian had laid aside his ragged garments and his air of brutal ferocity he wore a long frock coat of green cloth and a round hat whilst his shirt and cravat were remarkable for their whiteness but for the hideousness of his features and the fierce glance of his eyes always restless and suspicious this fellow might have been taken by his quiet and steady step for an honest citizen the chouette was also in her sunday costume wearing a large shawl of fine wool with a large pattern and held in her hand a capacious basket the rain having ceased for the moment rodolph overcoming a sensation of disgust went to meet the frightful pair for the slang of the tapis franc the schoolmaster now substituted a style almost polished and which betokened a cultivated mind in strange contrast with his real character and crimes when rodolph approached the brigand made him a polite bow and the chouette curtsied respectfully sir your humble servant said the schoolmaster i am delighted to pay my respects to you delighted or rather to renew our acquaintance for the night before last you paid me two blows of the fist which were enough to have felled a rhinoceros but not a word of that now it was a joke on your part i am sure merely done in jest let us not say another word about it for serious business brings us now together i saw the chourineur yesterday about eleven o'clock at the tapis franc and appointed to meet him here to-day in case he chose to join us to be our fellow-labourer but it seems that he most decidedly refuses you then accept the proposal your name sir if you be so good rodolph monsieur rodolph we will go into the panier fleuri neither myself nor madame has breakfasted and we will talk over our little matters whilst we are taking a crust most willingly we can talk as we go on you and the chourineur certainly do owe some satisfaction to my wife and myself you have caused us to lose more than two thousand francs chouette had a meeting near saint ouen with a tall gentleman in mourning who came to ask for you at the tapis franc he offered us two thousand francs to do something to you the chourineur has told me all about this but finette said the fellow go on and select a room at the panier fleuri and order breakfast some cutlets a piece of veal a salad and a couple of bottles of vin de bone the best quality and we will join you there the chouette who had not taken her eye off rodolph for a moment went off after exchanging looks with the schoolmaster who then said i say monsieur rodolph that the chourineur has edified me on the subject of the two thousand francs what do you mean by edified you you are right the language is a little too refined for you i would say that the chourineur nearly told me all that the tall gentleman in mourning with his two thousand francs required good not so good young man for the chourineur having yesterday morning met the chouette near saint ouen did not leave her for one moment when the tall gentleman in mourning came up so that he could not approach and converse with her you then ought to put us in the way of regaining our two thousand francs nothing easier but let us hark back i had proposed a glorious job to the chourineur which he at first accepted but afterwards refused to go on with he always had very peculiar ideas but whilst he refused he observed to me he made you observe oh diable you are very grand with your grammar it is my profession as a schoolmaster he made me then observe that he would not go on this lay he did not desire to discourage any other person and that you would willingly lend a hand in the affair 
may i without impertinence ask why you appointed a meeting with the chourineur at st ouen yesterday which gave him the advantage of meeting the chouette he was too much puzzled at my question to give me a clear answer rodolph bit his lips imperceptibly and replied shrugging his shoulders very likely for i only told him half my plan you must know not knowing if he had made up his mind that was very proper the more so as i had two strings to my bow you are a careful man you met the chourineur then at st ouen for rodolph after a moment's hesitation had the good luck to think of a story which would account for the want of address which the chourineur had displayed and said why this is it the attempt i propose is a famous one because the person in question is in the country all my fear was that he should return to paris to make sure i went to pierrefitte where his country house is situated and there i learned that he would not be back again until the day after to-morrow well but to return to my question why did you appoint to meet the chourineur at st ouen why you are not so bright as i took you for how far is it from pierrefitte to st ouen about a league and from st ouen to paris as much well if i had not found any one at pierrefitte that is if there had been an empty house there why there also would have been a good job not so good as in paris but still well worth having i went back to the chourineur who was waiting for me at st ouen we should have returned then to pierrefitte by a cross path which i know and i understand if on the contrary the job was to be done in paris we should have gained the barrier de l'etoile by the road of the Rivolt, and thence to the allée des veuves is but a step that is plain enough at st ouen you were well placed for either operation that was clear and now i can understand why the chourineur was at st ouen so the house in the allée des veuves will be uninhabited until the day after to-morrow uninhabited except the porter i see and is it a profitable job sixty thousand francs in gold in the proprietor's cabinet and you know all the ways perfectly silence here we are not a word before the vulgar i do not know if you feel as i do but the morning air has given me an appetite the chouette was awaiting them at the door this way this way she said i have ordered our breakfast rodolph wished the brigand to pass in first for certain reasons but the schoolmaster insisted on showing so much politeness that rodolph entered before him before he sat down the schoolmaster tapped lightly against each of the divisions of the wainscot that he might ascertain their thickness and power of transmitting sounds we need not be afraid to speak out said he the division is not thin we shall have our breakfast soon and shall not be disturbed in our conversation a waiter brought in the breakfast and before he shut the door rodolph saw the charcoal man murphy seated with great composure at a table in a room close at hand the room in which the scene took place that we are describing was long and narrow lighted by one window which looked into the street and was opposite to the door the chouette turned her back to this window whilst the schoolmaster was at one side of the table and rodolph on the other when the servant left the room the brigand got up took his plate and seated himself beside rodolph and between him and the door we can talk better he said and need not talk so loud and then you can prevent me from going out replied rodolph calmly the schoolmaster gave a nod in the affirmative and then half drawing out of the pocket of his frock coat a stiletto round and as thick as a goose's quill with a handle of wood which disappeared in the grasp of his hairy fingers said you see that i do advice to amateurs and bringing his shaggy brows together by a frown which made his wide and flat forehead closely resemble the tiger's he made a significant gesture and you may believe me added the chouette i have made the tool sharp rodolph with perfect coolness put his hand under his blouse and took out a double-barrelled pistol which he showed to the schoolmaster and then put into his pocket all right and now we understand each other but do not misunderstand me i am only alluding to an impossibility if they try to arrest me and you have laid any trap for me i will make cold meat of you and he gave a fierce look at rodolph and i will spring upon him and help you fourline cried the chouette rodolph made no reply but shrugged his shoulders and pouring out a glass of wine tossed it off his coolness deceived the schoolmaster 
i only put you on your guard well then put up your larding pin into your pocket you have no chicken to lard now i am an old cock and know my game as well as most said rodolph but to our business yes let us talk of business but do not speak against my larding pin it makes no noise and does not disturb anybody and does its work as should be doesn't it fourline added the old beldam by the way said rodolph to the chouette do you really know the goualeuse's parents my man has in his pocket two letters about it but she shall never see them the little slut i would rather tear her eyes out with my own hands oh when i meet her again at the tapis franc won't i pay her off there that'll do finette we have other things to talk of and so leave off your gossip may we patter before the mot asked rodolph most decidedly she's true as steel and is worth her weight in gold to watch for us to get information or impressions of keys to conceal stolen goods or sell them nothing comes amiss to her she is a first-rate manager good finette added the robber extending his hand to the horrid hag you can have no idea of the services she has done me take off your shawl finette or you'll be cold when you go out put it on the chair with your basket the chouette took off her shawl in spite of his presence of mind and the command which he had over himself rodolph could not quite conceal his surprise when he saw suspended by a ring of silver from a thick chain of metal which hung round the old creature's neck a small saint esprit in lapis lazuli precisely resembling that which the son of madame georges had round his neck when he was carried off at this discovery a sudden idea flashed across the mind of rodolph according to the chourineur's statement the schoolmaster had escaped from the bang six months ago and had since defied all search after him by disfiguring himself as he had now and six months ago the husband of madame georges had disappeared from the bang rodolph surmised that very possibly the schoolmaster was the husband of that unhappy lady if this were so he knew the fate of the son she lamented he possessed too some papers relative to the birth of the goualeuse rodolph had then fresh motives for persevering in his projects and fortunately his absence of mind was not observed by the schoolmaster who was busy helping the chouette morbleu what a pretty chain you have said rodolph to the one-eyed woman pretty and not dear answered the old creature laughing it is only a sham till my man can afford to give me a real one that will depend on this gentleman finette if our job comes off well why then it is astonishing how well it is imitated continued rodolph and what is that little blue thing at the end it is a present from my man which i shall wear until he gives me a ticker isn't it fourline rodolph's suspicions were thus half confirmed and he waited with anxiety for the reply of the schoolmaster who said you must take care of that notwithstanding the ticker finette it is a talisman and brings good luck a talisman said rodolph in a careless tone do you believe in talismans and where the devil did you pick it up give me the address of the shop they do not make them now the shop is shut up as you see it the bit of jewellery has a very great antiquity three generations i value it highly for it is a family loom added he with a hideous grin and that's why i gave it to finette that she might have good fortune in the enterprises in which she so skilfully seconds me only see her at work only see her if we go into business together why but let us now to our affair in hand you say that in the allee des veuves at number seventeen there is a house inhabited by a rich man whose name is i will not be guilty of the indiscretion of asking his name you say there are sixty thousand francs in gold in a cabinet sixty thousand francs in gold exclaimed the chouette rodolph nodded his head in the affirmative and you know this house and the people in it said the schoolmaster quite well is the entry difficult a wall seven feet high on the side of the allee des veuves a garden windows down to the ground and the house has only the ground floor throughout and there is only the porter to guard this treasure yes and what young man is your proposed plan of proceeding 
simple enough to climb over the wall pick the lock of the door or force open a shutter or lock what do you think of it i cannot answer you before i have examined it all myself that is by the aid of my wife but if all you tell me is as you say i think it would be the thing to do it at once this evening and the ruffian looked earnestly at rodolph this evening impossible replied he why since the occupier does not return until the day after to-morrow yes but i-i cannot this evening really well and i-i cannot to-morrow why not for the reason that prevents you this evening said the robber in a tone of mockery after a moment's reflection rodolph replied well then this evening be it where shall we meet we will not separate said the schoolmaster why not why should we what is the use of separating the weather has cleared up and we will go and walk about and give a look at the allée des veuves you will see how my woman will work when that is done we will return and play a hand at piquet and have a bit of something in a place in the champs elysees that i know near the river and as the allée des veuves is deserted at an early hour we will walk that way about ten o'clock i will join you at nine o'clock do you or do you not wish that we should do this job together i do wish it well then we do not separate before evening or else or else i shall think that you are making a plant for me and that's the reason you wish to part company now if i wish to set the traps after you what is to prevent my doing so this evening why everything you did not expect that i should propose the affair to you so soon and if you do not leave us you cannot put anybody up to it you mistrust me then most extremely but as what you propose may be quite true and honest and the half of sixty thousand francs is worth a risk i am willing to try for it but this evening or never if never i shall have my suspicions of you confirmed and one day or other i will take care and let you dine off a dish of my cooking and i will return your compliment rely on it oh this is all stuff and nonsense said the chouette i think with fourline to-night or never rodolph was in a state of extreme anxiety if he allowed this opportunity to escape of laying hands on the schoolmaster he might never again light on him the ruffian would ever afterwards be on his guard or if recognized apprehended and taken back to the bagne would carry with him that secret which rodolph had so much interest in discovering confiding in his address and courage and trusting to chance he said to the schoolmaster agreed then and we will not part company before evening then i'm your man it is now two o'clock it is some distance from here to the allee des veuves it is raining again in torrents let us pay the reckoning and take a coach if we have a coach i should like first to smoke a cigar why not said the schoolmaster finette does not mind the smell of tobacco well then i'll go and fetch some cigars said rodolph rising pray don't give yourself that trouble said the schoolmaster stopping him finette will go rodolph resumed his seat the schoolmaster had penetrated his design the chouette went out what a clever manager i have haven't i said the ruffian and so tractable she would throw herself into the fire for me apropos of fire it is not over warm here replied rodolph placing both his hands under his blouse and then continuing his conversation with the schoolmaster he took out a lead pencil and a morsel of paper which he had in his waistcoat pocket without being detected and wrote some words hastily taking care to make his letters wide apart so that they might be more legible for he wrote under his blouse and without seeing what he wrote this note escaped the penetration of the schoolmaster the next thing was to enable it to reach its address rodolph rose and went listlessly towards the window and began to hum a tune between his teeth accompanying himself on the window glasses the schoolmaster came up to the window and said to rodolph what tune are you playing i am playing tu n'auras pas ma rose and a very pretty tune it is i should like to know if it would have the effect of making any of the passers-by turn around i had no such intention you are wrong young man for you are playing the tambourine on that pane of glass with all your might but i was thinking the porter of this house in the allee des veuves is perhaps a stout fellow if he resists you have only your pistol which is a noisy weapon 
whilst a tool like this and he showed rodolph the handle of his poignard makes no noise and does not disturb anybody do you mean then to assassinate him exclaimed rodolph if you have any such intention let us give up the job altogether i will have no hand in it so don't rely on me but if he wakes we will take our heels well just as you like only it is better to come to a clear understanding beforehand so then ours is simply a mere robbery with forcible entry nothing more that's very silly and contemptible but so be it and as i will not leave you for a second thought rodolph i will prevent you from shedding blood End of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen Preparations. The Chouette returned to the room, bringing the cigars with her. I don't think it rains now, said Rodolph, lighting his cigar. Suppose we go and fetch the coach ourselves, it will stretch our legs. What, not rain? replied the schoolmaster. Are you blind? do you think i will expose finette to the chance of catching cold and exposing her precious life and spoiling her new shawl you are right old fellow it rains cats and dogs let the servant come and we can pay him and desire him to fetch us a coach replied rodolph that's the most sensible thing you have said yet young fellow we may go and look about as we seek the allée des veuves the servant entered and rodolph gave her five francs ah sir it is really an imposition i cannot allow it exclaimed the schoolmaster oh all right your turn next time be it so but on condition that i shall offer you something by and by in a little cabaret in the champs elysees a capital little snuggery that i know of just as you like the servant paid and they left the room rodolph wished to go last but out of politeness to the chouette but the schoolmaster would not allow it and followed close on his heels watching his every movement the master of the house kept a wine-shop also and amongst other drinkers a charcoal man with his face blackened and his large hat flapping over his eyes was paying his shot at the bar when these three personages appeared in spite of the close lookout of the schoolmaster and the one-eyed hag rodolph who had walked before the hideous pair exchanged a rapid and unperceived glance with murphy as he got into the hackney coach which way am i to go master asked the driver rodolph replied in a loud voice allez de des acacias in the bois de boulogne cried the schoolmaster interrupting him then he added and we will pay you well coachman the door was shut what the devil made you bawl out which way we were going before these people said the schoolmaster if the thing were found out to-morrow we might be traced and discovered young man young man you are very imprudent the coach was already in motion rodolph answered true i did not think of that but with my cigar i shall smoke you like herrings let us have a window open and joining the action to the words rodolph with much dexterity let fall outside the window the morsel of paper folded very small on which he had hastily written a few words in pencil under his blouse the schoolmaster's glance was so quick that in spite of the calmness of rodolph's features the ruffian detected some expression of triumph for putting his head out of the window he called out to the driver whip behind whip behind there is someone getting up at the back of the coach the coach stopped and the driver standing on his seat looked back and said no master there is no one there parbleu i will look myself replied the schoolmaster jumping out into the street not seeing any person or anything for since rodolph had dropped the paper the coach had gone on several yards the schoolmaster thought he was mistaken you will laugh at me he said as he resumed his seat but i don't know why i thought some one was following us the coach at this moment turned round a corner and murphy who had not lost sight of it with his eyes and had seen rodolph's manoeuvre ran and picked up the little note which had fallen into a crevice between two of the paving stones at the end of a quarter of an hour the schoolmaster said to the driver of the hackney-coach my man we have changed our minds drive to the place de la madeleine 
rodolph looked at him with astonishment all right young man from hence we may go to a thousand different places if they seek to track us hereafter the deposition of the coachman will not be of the slightest service to them at the moment when the coach was approaching the barrier a tall man clothed in a long white riding-coat with his hat drawn over his eyes and whose complexion appeared of a deep brown passed rapidly along the road stooping over the neck of a high splendid hunter which trotted with extraordinary speed a good horse and a good rider said rodolph leaning forward to the door of the coach and following murphy for it was he with his eyes what a pace that stout man goes did you see him ma foi he passed so very quickly said the schoolmaster that i did not remark him rodolph calmly concealed his satisfaction murphy had doubtless deciphered the almost hieroglyphic characters of the note which he had dropped and which had escaped the vigilance of the schoolmaster certain that the coach was not followed he had become more assured and desirous of imitating the chouette who slept or rather pretended to sleep he said to rodolph excuse me young man but the motion of the coach always produces a singular effect on me it sends me off to sleep like a child the ruffian under the guise of assumed sleep thought to examine whether the physiognomy of his companion betrayed any emotion but rodolph was on his guard and replied i rose so early that i feel sleepy and will have a nap too he shut his eyes and very soon the hard breathing of the schoolmaster and the chouette who snored in chorus so completely deceived rodolph that thinking his companion sound asleep he half opened his eyes the schoolmaster and the chouette in spite of their loud snoring had their eyes open and were exchanging some mysterious signs by means of their fingers curiously placed or bent in the palms of their hands the brigand no doubt perceived by some almost imperceptible sign that rodolph was not asleep and said in a laughing tone ah ha comrade what you were trying your friends were you that can't astonish you who sleep with your eyes open i who that's different young man i am a sonambulist the hackney coach stopped in the place de la madeleine the rain had ceased for a moment but the clouds driven by the violence of the wind were so dark and so low that it was almost night in appearance rodolph the chouette and the schoolmaster went towards the cour de la reine young man i have an idea which is not a bad one said the robber what is it to ascertain if all that you have told us respecting the interior of the house in the allée des Veuves is true you surely will not go there now under any circumstances it would awaken suspicion i am not such a flat as that young fellow but why have i a wife whose name is finette the chouette drew up her head do you see her young man why she looks like a war-horse when he hears the blast of the trumpet you mean to send her as a lookout precisely so number seventeen allée des veuves isn't it my man cried the chouette impatiently make yourself easy i have but one eye but that is a good one do you see young man do you see she is all impatience to be at work if she manages cleverly to get into the house i do not think your idea a bad one take the umbrella fourline in half an hour i will be here again and you shall see what i will do said the chouette one moment finette we are going down to the bleeding heart only two steps from here if the little tortillard cripple is there you had better take him with you he will remain outside on the watch whilst you go inside the house you are right little tortillard is as cunning as a fox he is not ten years of age and yet it was he who the other day a signal from the schoolmaster interrupted the chouette what does the bleeding heart mean it is an odd sign for a cabaret asked rodolph you must complain to the landlord what is his name the landlord of the bleeding heart yes what is that to you he never asks the names of his customers but still call him what you like peter thomas christopher or barnabas he will answer to any and all but here we are and it's time we were for the rain is coming down again in floods and how the river roars it has almost become a torrent why look at it two more days of such rain and the water will overflow the arches of the bridge 
you say that we are there but where the devil is the cabaret i do not see any house here certainly not if you look round about you where should i look then at your feet at my feet yes and whereabouts here look do you see the roof mind and don't step upon it rodolph had not remarked one of those subterraneans which used to be seen some years since in certain spots in the champs elysees and particularly near the cour de la reine a flight of steps cut out of the damp and greasy ground led to the bottom of this sort of deep ditch against one end of which cut perpendicularly leaned a low mean dilapidated hovel its roof covered with moss-covered tiles was scarcely so high as the ground on which rodolph was standing two or three outbuildings constructed of worm-eaten planks serving as cellar woodhouse and rabbit hutches surrounded this wretched den a narrow path which extended along this ditch led from the stairs to the door of the hut the rest of the ground was concealed under a mass of trellis-work which sheltered two rows of clumsy tables fastened to the ground a worn-out iron sign swung heavily backwards and forwards on its creaking hinges and through the rust that covered it might still be seen a red heart pierced with an arrow the sign was supported by a post erected above this cave this real human burrow a thick and moist fog was added to the rain as night approached what think you of this hotel young fellow inquired the schoolmaster why thanks to the torrents that have fallen for the last fortnight it must be deliciously fresh but come on one moment i wish to know if the landlord is in hark the ruffian then thrusting his tongue forcibly against his palate produced a singular noise a sort of guttural sound loud and lengthened something like purr a similar note came from the depths of the hovel he's there said the schoolmaster pardon me young man respect to the ladies allow the chouette to pass first i follow you mind how you come it's slippery end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the mysteries of paris volume one by eugene Sue. this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen the bleeding heart the landlord of the bleeding heart after having responded to the signal of the schoolmaster advanced politely to the threshold of his door this personage whom rodolph had been to see in the cite and whom he did not yet know under his true name or rather his habitual surname was bras rouge lank mean-looking and feeble this man might be fifty years of age his countenance resembled both the weasel and the rat his peaked nose his receding chin his high cheekbones his small eyes black restless and keen gave his features an indescribable expression of malice cunning and sagacity an old brown wig or rather as yellow as his bilious complexion perched on the top of his head showed the nape of the old fellow's withered neck he had on a round jacket and one of those long black aprons worn by the waiters at the wine-shops our three acquaintances had hardly descended the last step of the staircase when a child of about ten years of age rickety lame and somewhat misshapen came to rejoin bras rouge whom he resembled in so striking a manner that there was no mistaking them for father and son there was the same quick and cunning look joined to that impudent hardened and knavish air which is peculiar to the scamp voyou of paris that fearful type of precocious depravity that real hemp seed graine de bang as they style it in the horrible slang of the jail the forehead of the brat was half lost beneath a thatch of yellowish locks as harsh and stiff as horsehair reddish-coloured trousers and a grey blouse confined by a leather girdle completed tortillard's costume whose nickname was derived from his infirmity he stood close to his father standing on his sound leg like a heron by the side of a marsh ah here is the darling one mom said the schoolmaster finette night is coming on and time is pressing we must profit by the daylight which is left to us you are right my man i will ask the father to spare his darling good day old friend said bras rouge addressing the schoolmaster in a voice which was cracked sharp and shrill what can i do for you 
why if you could spare your small boy to my mistress for a quarter of an hour she has lost something which he could help her to look for bras rouge winked his eye and made a sign to the schoolmaster and then said to the child tortillard go with madame the hideous brat hopped forward and took hold of the one-eyed hand love of a bright boy come along there is a child said finette and how like his father he is not like pigriotte who always pretended to have a pain in her side when she came near me a little baggage come come away be off finette keep your weather eye open and bright lookout i await you here i won't be long go first tortillard the one-eyed hag and the little cripple went up the slippery steps finette take the umbrella the brigand called out it would be in the way my man said the old woman who quickly disappeared with tortillard in the midst of the fog which thickened with the twilight and the hollow murmur of the wind as it moaned through the thick and leafless branches of the tall elms in the champs elysees let us go in said rodolph it was requisite to stoop in passing in at the door of the cabaret which was divided into two apartments in one was a bar and a broken-down billiard-table in the other tables and garden chairs which had once been painted green two narrow windows with their cracked panes festooned with spiders webs cast a dim but not religious light on the damp walls rodolph was alone for one moment only during which bras rouge and the schoolmaster had time to exchange some words rapidly uttered and some mysterious signs you'll take a glass of beer or brandy perhaps whilst we wait for finette said the schoolmaster no i am not thirsty do as you like i am for a drain of brandy said the ruffian and he seated himself on one of the little green tables in the second apartment darkness came on to this den so completely that it was impossible to see in one of the angles of this inner apartment the open mouth of one of those cellars which are entered by a door in two divisions one of which was constantly kept open for the convenience of access the table at which the schoolmaster sat was close upon this dark and deep hall and he turned his back upon it so that it was entirely concealed from rodolph's view he was looking through the window in order to command his countenance and conceal the workings of his thoughts the sight of murphy speeding through the allée des veuves did not quite assure him he was afraid that the worthy squire had not quite understood the full meaning of his note necessarily so laconic and containing only these words this evening ten o'clock be on your guard resolved not to go to the allée des veuves before that moment nor to lose sight of the schoolmaster for an instant he yet trembled at the idea of losing the only opportunity that might ever be afforded him of obtaining that secret which he was so excessively anxious to possess although he was powerful and well armed yet he had to deal with an unscrupulous assassin capable of any and everything not desiring however that his thoughts should be detected he seated himself at the table with the schoolmaster and by way of seeming at his ease called for a glass of something bras rouge having exchanged a few words in a low tone with the brigand looked at rodolph with an air in which curiosity distrust and contempt were mingled it is my advice young man said the schoolmaster that if my wife informs us that the persons we wish to see are within we had better make our call about eight o'clock that will be two hours too soon said rodolph and that will spoil all do you think so i am sure of it bah amongst friends there should be no ceremony i know them well and i tell you that we must not think of going before ten o'clock are you out of your senses young man i give you my opinion and devil fetch me if i stir from here before ten o'clock don't disturb yourself i never close my establishment before midnight said bras rouge in his falsetto voice it is the time when my best customers drop in and my neighbours never complain of the noise which is made in my house i must agree to all you wish young man continued the schoolmaster be it so then we will not set out on our visit until ten o'clock here is the chouette said bras rouge hearing and replying to a warning cry similar to that which the schoolmaster had uttered before he descended to the subterraneous abode a minute afterwards the chouette entered the billiard-room alone it is all right my man i've done the trick 
cried the one-eyed hag as she entered bras rouge discreetly withdrew without asking a word about tortillard whom perhaps he did not expect to see return the belle dame sat with her face towards rodolph and the brigand well said the schoolmaster the young fellow has told us all true so far ah you see i was right exclaimed rodolph let the chouette tell her tale young man come tell us all about it finette i went straight to number seventeen leaving tortillard on the lookout and concealed in a corner it was still daylight and i rung at a side door which opens outwards and here's about two inches of space between it and the sill nothing else to notice i rang the porter opened before i pulled the bell i had put my bonnet in my pocket that i might look like a neighbour as soon as i saw the porter i pretended to cry violently saying that i had lost a pet parrot cocotte a little darling that i adored i told him i lived in the rue marboeuf and that i had pursued cocotte from garden to garden and entreated him to allow me to enter and try and find the bird ah said the schoolmaster with an air of proud satisfaction pointing to finette what a woman very clever said rodolph and what then the porter allowed me to look for the creature and i went trotting all around the garden calling cocotte cocotte and looked about me in every direction to scrutinize everything inside the walls continued the horrid old hag going on with her description of the premises inside the walls trellis work all around a perfect staircase at the left-hand corner of the wall a fir tree just like a ladder a lying-in woman might descend by it the house has six windows on the ground floor and has no upper story six small windows without any fastening the windows of the ground floor close with shutters having hooks below and staples in the upper part press in the bottom use your steel file a push said the schoolmaster and it is open the chouette continued the entrance has a glass door two venetian blinds outside memorandum said the ruffian quite correct it is as precise as if we saw it said rodolph on the left resumed the chouette near the courtyard is a well the rope may be useful for at that particular spot there is no trellis against the wall in case retreat should be cut off in the direction of the door on entering into the house you got inside the house then young man she got inside the house said the schoolmaster with pride to be sure i got in not finding cocotte i had made so much lamentation that i pretended i was quite out of breath i begged the porter to allow me to sit down on the step of the door and he very kindly asked me to step in offering me a glass of wine and water a glass of plain water i said plain water only my good sir then he made me go into the antechamber carpeted all over good precaution footsteps or broken glass cannot be heard if we must mill the glaze break a pane of glass right and left doors with sliding bolts which open by a gentle push from the top at the bottom was a strong door locked it looked very like a money chest i had my wax in my basket she had her wax young man she never goes without her wax said the brigand the chouette proceeded it was necessary to approach the door which smelled so strongly of the cash so i pretended that i was seized with a fit of coughing so violent that i was compelled to lean against the wall for support hearing me cough the porter said i'll fetch you a morsel of sugar to put in your water he probably looked for a spoon for i heard plate chink plate in the room on the left hand don't forget that fourline well coughing and wheezing i reached the door at the bottom i had my wax in the palm of my hand i leaned against the lock as though accidentally and here is the impression we may not want it to-day but another time it may be useful 
and the chouette gave the brigand a bit of yellow wax on which the print of the lock was perfectly impressed you can tell us whether this is the door of the money chest said the chouette it is and there is the cash replied rodolph and then said to himself has murphy then been the dupe of this cursed old hag perhaps so and he only expects to be assailed at ten o'clock by that time every precaution will have been taken but all the money is not there continued the chouette and her one green eye sparkled as i approached the window still searching for my darling cocotte i saw in one of the chambers door on the left some bags of crown pieces in a bureau i saw them as plainly as i see you my man there were at least a dozen of them where is tortillard said the schoolmaster in his hiding-place not more than two paces from the garden he can see in the dark like a cat there is only that one entrance to number seventeen so when we go he will tell us if any one has come or not that's good the schoolmaster had scarcely uttered these words than he made a sudden rush at rodolph grappled him by the throat and flung him violently down the cellar which was yawning behind the table the attack was so rapid unexpected and powerful that rodolph could neither foresee nor avoid it the chouette alarmed uttered a piercing shriek for at the first moment she had not seen the result of the struggle when the noise of rodolph's body rolling down the steps had ceased the schoolmaster who knew all the ways and windings of the underground vaults in the place went down the stairs slowly listening as he went fourline be on your guard cried the beldame leaning over the opening of the trap draw your pinking iron the brigand disappeared without any reply for a time nothing was heard but at the end of a few moments the distant noise of a door shutting which creaked on its rusty hinges sounded harshly in the depths of the cavern then all was again still as death the darkness was complete the chouette fumbled in her basket and then producing a lucifer match lighted a wax taper whose feeble ray made visible the darkness of this dreary den at this moment the monster visage of the schoolmaster appeared at the opening of the trap the chouette could not repress an exclamation of horror at the sight of his ghastly seamed mutilated and fearful face with eyes that gleamed like phosphorus and seemed to glare on the ground even in the midst of the darkness which the lighted taper could not entirely dissipate having subdued her feeling of fright the old hag exclaimed in a tone of horrible flattery you must be an awful man fourline for even i was frightened yes i quick quick for the allée des veuves said the ruffian securely closing the double flap of the trap with a bar of iron in another hour perhaps it will be too late if it is a trap it is not yet baited if it is not we can do the job alone End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the mysteries of paris volume one by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the vault stunned by his horrible fall rodolph lay senseless and motionless at the bottom of the stairs down which he had been hurled the schoolmaster dragging him to the entrance of a second and still deeper cavern thrust him into its hideous recesses and closing and securely bolting a massy iron-shod door returned to his worthy confederate the chouette who was waiting to join him in the proposed robbery it might be murder in the allée des veuves about the end of an hour rodolph began though slowly to resume his consciousness he found himself extended on the ground in the midst of thick darkness he extended his hand and touched the stone stairs descending to the vault a sensation of extreme cold about his feet induced him to endeavour by feeling the ground to ascertain the cause his fingers dabbled in a pool of water with a violent effort he contrived to seat himself on the lower step of the staircase the giddiness arising from his fall subsided by degrees and as he became able to extend his limbs he found to his great joy that though severely shaken and confused no bones were broken he listened the only sound that reached his ear was a low dull pattering but continued noise of which he was then far from divining the cause 
as his senses became more clear so did the circumstances to which he had been the unfortunate victim return to his imagination and just as he had recalled each particular and was deeply considering the possible result of the whole he became aware that his feet were wholly submerged in water it had indeed risen above his ankle in the midst of the heavy gloom and deep silence which surrounded him he heard still the same dull trickling sound he had observed before and now the matter was clear to him now indeed he comprehended all the horrors of his situation the cave was filling with water arising from the fearful and formidable overflowing of the seine the dungeon in which he had been thrown was doubtless beneath the level of the river and was chosen by his jailers for that purpose as offering a slow though certain means of destruction the conviction of his danger recalled rodolph entirely to himself quick as lightning he made his way up the damp slippery stairs arrived at the top he came in contact with a thick door he tried in vain to open it its massy hinges resisted his most vigorous efforts to force them at this moment of despair and danger his first thought was for murphy if he had not been on his guard these monsters will murder him cried he it will be i who shall have caused his death my good my faithful murphy this cruel thought nerved the arm of rodolph with fresh vigour and again he bent his most powerful energy to endeavour to force the ponderous door alas the thickly plated iron with which it was covered mocked his utmost efforts and sore weary and exhausted he was compelled to relinquish the fruitless task again he descended into the cave in hopes of obtaining something which might serve as a lever to force the hinges or wrench the fastenings groping against the slimy walls he felt himself continually treading on some sort of round elastic bodies which appeared to slip from under his feet and to scramble for safety past him they were rats driven by the fast rising water from their retreats groping about the place on all fours with the water half way up his leg rodolph felt in all directions for the weapon he so much desired to find nothing but the damp walls met his touch however and in utter despair he resumed his position at the top of the steps of the thirteen stairs which composed the flight three were already under water thirteen had ever been rodolph's unlucky number there are moments when the strongest minds are under the influence of superstitious ideas and at this juncture rodolph viewed the fatal amount of stairs as an ill augury again the possible fate of murphy recurred to him and as if inspired by a fresh hope he eagerly felt around the door to discover some slight chink or opening by which his cries for help might be heard in vain the dampness of the soil had swollen the wood and joined it hermetically to the wet slimy earth rodolph next tried the powers of his voice and shouted with the fullest expansion of his lungs trusting that his cries for assistance might reach the adjoining cabaret and then tired and exhausted sat down to listen nothing was to be heard no sound disturbed the deep sleep which reigned but the drop 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 the dull trickling monotonous bubbling of the fast increasing waters his last hope extinguished rodolph seated himself in gloomy despair and leaning his back against the door bewailed the perilous situation of his faithful friend perhaps at that very moment struggling beneath the assassin's knife bitterly did he then regret his rash and venturesome projects however good and generous the motives by which he had been instigated and severely did he reproach himself for having taken advantage of the devotion of murphy who rich honoured and esteemed by all who knew him had quitted a beloved wife and child to assist rodolph in the bold undertaking he had imposed on himself during these sorrowful reflections the water was still rising rapidly and five steps now only remained dry rodolph now found himself compelled to assume a standing position though in so doing his forehead was brought in close contact with the very top of the vault he calculated the probable duration of his mortal agony of the period which must elapse ere this slow inch-like death would put a period to his misery he bethought him of the pistol he carried with him and at the risk of injuring himself in the attempt he determined to fire it off against the door so as to disturb some of the fastenings by the concussion but here again a disappointment awaited him the pistol was nowhere to be found and he could but conclude it had fallen from his pocket during his struggle with the schoolmaster but for his deep concern on murphy's account 
rodolph would have met his death unmoved his conscience acquitted him of all intentional offence nay it solaced him with the recollection of good actually performed and much more meditated to the degrees of an all-wise and inscrutable providence he resigned himself and humbly accepted his present punishment as the just reward for a criminal action as yet unexpiated a fresh trial of his fortitude awaited him the rats still pursued by the fast-gathering waters finding no other means of escape sought refuge from one step to another ascending as fast as the rising flood rendered their position untenable unable to scale the perpendicular walls or doors they availed themselves of the vestments of rodolph whose horror and disgust rose to an indescribable degree as he felt their cold clammy paws and wet hairy bodies crawling or clinging to him in his attempts to repulse them their sharp cold bite inflicted on him a most acute agony while his face and hands streamed with blood from the multitude of wounds received again he called for help shouted aloud and almost screamed in his pain and wretchedness alas a dull echo of the vault and the gurgling waters alone replied a few short moments and he would be bereft even of the power of calling upon god or man to help him the rapidly rising flood had now reached his very throat and ere long would have ascended to his lips the choked air began too to fail in the narrow space now left it and the first symptoms of asphyxia began to oppress rodolph the arteries of his temples beat violently his head became giddy and the faint sickness of death seemed to make his chest heave convulsively already were the waters gurgling in his ears a dizziness of sight and a confusion of ideas had well nigh deprived him of all powers of sight or sound the last glimmer of reason was well nigh shaken from her throne when hasty steps and the sound of voices on the other side of the door were heard hope recalled his expiring strength and making one powerful effort rodolph was able to distinguish the following words after which all consciousness forsook him did i not tell you so there you see there is no one here do's take it no more there is replied the voice of the chourineur in a tone of vexation and disappointment and the sounds died away rodolph utterly exhausted had no longer power to sustain himself his limbs sunk from under him and he slid unresistingly down the stone steps all at once the door of the vault was abruptly opened from the other side and the swelling masses contained in the inner vault glad to find a further outlet rushed onwards as though bursting through the gates of a sluice and the chourineur whose opportune return shall be accounted for by and by seized the two arms of rodolph who half dead had mechanically clung to the threshold of the door and bore him from the black and rushing waters which had nigh proved his grave End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the mysteries of paris volume one by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen the sick nurse snatched by the chourineur from a certain death and removed to the house in the allée des veuves which had been reconnoitred by the chouette previously to the attempt on it by the schoolmaster rodolph was placed in bed in a comfortably furnished apartment a cheerful fire was burning on the hearth a lamp placed on the neighbouring table diffused a strong clear light while the bed of rodolph shaded by thick curtains of green damask remained protected from the glare and in the shadow of its deep recess a negro of middle stature with white hair and eyebrows wearing an orange and green riband at the buttonhole of his blue coat sat by the bedside holding in his right hand a second's watch which he appeared to consult while counting with his left the beating of rodolph's pulse the expression of the negro's countenance was at once sad and pensive and he continued from time to time to gaze on the sleeping man with the most tender solicitude the chourineur clad in rags and soiled with mud stood motionless with folded arms at the foot of the bed his red beard was long and matted in disorder his thick bushy hair was tangled with mud and wet which still dripped from it while his hard bronze features were marked by the most profound pity for the patient hardly venturing to breathe lest the heaving of his huge chest should disturb the invalid he awaited with the most intense anxiety the result of the doctor's observations on the sick man's state then as though to while away the fearful apprehension of an unfavourable opinion 
he continued to deliver his thoughts aloud after the following manner who would think now to see him lying there so helpless he could ever have been the man to give me such a precious drubbing as i got from him i dare say though he will soon be up again well and strong as ever don't you think so monsieur le docteur faith i only wish he could drum himself well upon my back i'd lend it him as long as he liked but perhaps that would shake him too much and over fatigue him would it sir addressing the negro whose only reply was an impatient wave of the hand the chourineur was instantly silent the draught said the doctor the chourineur who had respectfully left his nailed shoes at the door at these words arose and walked towards the table indicated by the negro's finger going on the very top of his toes drawing up his legs extending his arms and swelling out his back and shoulders in a manner so ludicrous as under other circumstances would have been highly diverting the poor fellow seemed endeavouring to collect his whole weight so that no portion of it should touch the floor which in spite of his energetic efforts to prevent it groaned beneath his ponderous limbs as they moved towards the desired spot unfortunately between his over-anxiety to acquit himself well in his important mission and his fear of dropping the delicate pile he was bringing so over carefully he grasped the slight neck so tightly in his huge hand that it shivered to atoms and the precious liquid was expended on the carpet at the sight of this unfortunate mischance the chourineur remained in mute astonishment one of his huge legs in the air his toes nervously contracted and looking with a stupefied air alternately from the doctor to the fragments of the bottle and from that to the morsel his thumb and finger were yet tightly holding awkward devil exclaimed the negro impatiently yes that i am responded the chourineur as though grateful for the sound of a voice to break the frightful bewilderment of his ideas ah cried the esculapius observing the table attentively happily you took the wrong file i wanted the other one what that little one with the red stuff inquired the unlucky sick nurse in a low and humble tone of course i mean that why there is no other left the chourineur turning quickly around upon his heels after his old military fashion crushed the fragments of glass which lay on the carpet beneath his feet more delicate ones might have suffered severely from the circumstance but the ex debardeur had a pair of natural sandals hard as the hoofs of a horse have a care cried the physician you will hurt yourself to this caution the chourineur paid no attention but seemed wholly absorbed in so discharging his new mission as should effectually destroy all recollection of his late clumsiness it was really beautiful to behold the scrupulous delicacy and lightness of touch with which spreading out his two first fingers he seized the fragile crystal avoiding all use of the unlucky thumb whose undue pressure he rightly conceived had brought about his previous accident he kept so widely stretched from his forefinger that a butterfly might have passed between with outspread wings without losing one atom of its golden plumage the black doctor trembled lest all this caution should lead to a second misadventure but happily the file reached its destination in safety as the chourineur approached the bed he again smashed beneath his tread some of the fallen relics of the former potion the deuce take you man do you want to maim yourself for life lame myself asked the eager nurse why yes you keep walking upon glass as though you were trying for it oh bless you never mind that the soles of my feet are hard as iron must be something sharper than glass could hurt them a teaspoon said the doctor the chourineur recommenced his évolution sylphidique and returned with the article required after having swallowed a few spoonfuls of the mixture rodolph began to stir in his bed and faintly moved his hands good good he is recovering from his stupor said the doctor speaking to himself that bleeding has relieved him he is now out of danger saved bravo vive la charte exclaimed the chourineur in the full burst of his joy hold your tongue and pray be quiet said the negro in a tone of command to be sure i will monsieur le médecin his pulse is becoming regular very well indeed excellent and that poor friend of monsieur rodolph's body and bones of me when he comes to know that but then luckily silence i say certainly monsieur le docteur and sit down but monsieur le 
sit down i tell you you disturb me twisting and fidgeting about in that manner you distract my attention come sit down at once and keep still but doctor don't you perceive i am as dirty as a pile of floating wood just going to be unloaded all slime and wet you see i should spoil the furniture then sit down on the ground i should soil the carpet do what you like but for heaven's sake be quiet said the doctor in a tone of impatience then throwing himself into an armchair he leaned his head upon his clasped hands and appeared lost in deep reflection after a moment of profound meditation the chourineur less from any need he felt for repose than in obedience to the doctor's commands took a chair with the utmost precaution turned it upside down with an air of intense self-satisfaction at having at length devised a plan to act in strict conformity with the orders received and yet avoid all risk of soiling the silken cushion having laid the back on the ground he proceeded after all manner of delicate arrangements to take his seat on the outer rails but unhappily the chourineur was entirely ignorant of the laws of the lever and the equilibrium of bodies the chair overbalanced and the luckless individual seated thereon in endeavouring to save himself from falling by an involuntary movement caught hold of a small stand on which was a tray containing some tea-things at the formidable noise caused by so many falling articles clattering upon the head of the unfortunate cause of all this discord and havoc the doctor sprung from his seat while rodolph awaking with a start raised himself on his elbow looked about him with an anxious and perturbed glance then passing his hand over his brows as though trying to arrange his ideas he inquired where is murphy your royal highness need be under no apprehensions on his account answered the negro respectfully there is every hope of his recovery recovery he is then wounded unhappily my lord he is where is he let me see him and rodolph endeavoured to rise but fell back again overcome by weakness and the intense pain he felt from his many and severe contusions since i cannot walk cried he at length let me be instantly carried to murphy this moment my lord he sleeps at present it would be highly dangerous at this particular juncture to expose him to the slightest agitation you are deceiving me and he is dead he has been murdered and i i am the wretched cause of it cried rodolph in a tone of agony raising his clasped hands towards heaven my lord knows that his servant is incapable of falsehood i assert by my honour that although severely wounded murphy lives and that his chance of recovery is all but certain you say that but to prepare me for more disastrous tidings he lies doubtless wounded past all hope and he my faithful friend will die my lord yes you are seeking to deceive me till all is over but i will see him i will judge for myself the sight of a friend cannot be hurtful let me be instantly removed to his chamber once more my lord i pledge my solemn assurance that barring chances not likely to occur murphy will soon be convalescent my dear david may i indeed believe you you may indeed my lord hear me you know the high opinion i entertain of your ability and knowledge and that from the hour in which you were attached to my household you have possessed my most unbounded confidence never for one instant have i doubted your great skill and perfect acquaintance with your profession but i conjure you if a consultation be necessary my lord that would have been my first thought had i seen the slightest reason for such a step but up to the present moment it would be useless and unnecessary and besides i should be somewhat tenacious of introducing strangers into the house until i knew whether your orders of yesterday but how has all this happened said rodolph interrupting the black who saved me from drowning in that horrid cellar i have a confused recollection of having heard the chourineur's voice there was i mistaken not at all mistaken my lord but let the brave fellow to whom all praise is due relate the affair in which he was the principal actor himself where is he where is he the doctor looked about for the recently elected sick nurse and at length found him thoroughly silenced and shamed by his late tumble ensconced behind the curtains of the bed here he is said the doctor he looks somewhat shamefaced come forward my brave fellow said rodolph extending his hand to his preserver 
the confusion of the poor chourineur was still further increased from having when behind his curtain heard the black doctor address rodolph continually as my lord or your royal highness approach my friend my deliverer said rodolph and give me your hand i beg pardon sir i mean my lord no highness no call me monsieur rodolph as you used to do i like it better and so do i it comes so much easier to one but be so good as to excuse my hand i have done so much work lately that your hand i tell you your hand overcome by this kind and persevering command the chourineur timidly extended his black and horny palm which rodolph warmly shook now then sit down and tell me all about it how you discovered the cellar but i think i can guess the schoolmaster we have him in safety said the black doctor yes he and the chouette tied together like two rolls of tobacco a pair of pretty creatures they look as ever you would wish to see and i doubt not sick enough of each other's company by this time ah my poor murphy what a selfish wretch must i be to think only of myself where is he wounded david in the right side my lord but fortunately towards the lower false rib oh i must have a deep and terrible revenge for this david i depend upon your assistance my lord knows full well that i am wholly devoted to him both body and soul replied the negro coldly but how my noble fellow were you able to arrive here in time said rodolph to the chourineur why if you please my lord no sir uh, highness rodolph i had better begin by the beginning quite right i am listening go on but mind you are only to call me monsieur rodolph very well you know that last night you told me after you returned from the country where you had gone with poor goualeuse try and find the schoolmaster in the cite tell him you know of a capital put-up that you have refused to join it but that if he will take your place he has only to be to-morrow that's to-day at the barrier of bercy at the panier fleuri and there he will see the man who has made the plant qui a nourri le poupard well on leaving you i pushed on briskly for the cite i goes to the ogresses no schoolmaster then to the rue saint eloi on to the rue aux fèves then to the rue de la vieille draperie couldn't find my man at last i stumbled upon him in that old devil skin chouette in the front of notre dame at the shop of a tailor who is a fence and thief note eight fence receiver of stolen goods they were sporting the blunt which they had prigged from the tall gentleman in black who wanted to do something to you they bought themselves some toggery the chouette bargained for a red shawl an old monster i told my tale to the schoolmaster and he snapped at it and said he would be at the rendezvous accordingly so far so good this morning according to your orders i ran here to bring you the answer you said to me my lad return to-morrow before daybreak you must pass the day in the house and in the evening you will see something which will be worth seeing you did not let out more than that but i was fly and said to myself this is a dodge to catch the schoolmaster to-morrow by laying a right bait for him he is a blank scoundrel he murdered the cattle dealer and as they say another person besides in the rue du roule i see all about it my mistake was not to have told you all my good fellow then this horrible result would not have occurred that was your affair monsieur rodolph all that concerned me was to serve you for truth to say i don't know how or why but as i have told you before i feel as if i were your bulldog but that's enough i said then monsieur rodolph pays me for my time so my time is his and i will employ it for him then an idea strikes me the schoolmaster is cunning he may suspect a trap monsieur rodolph will propose to him the job for to-morrow it is true but the downy cove is likely enough to come to-day and lurk about and reconnoitre the ground and if he is suspicious of monsieur rodolph he will bring some other cracksman robber with him and do the trick on his own account to prevent this i said to myself i must go and plant myself somewhere where i may get a view of the walls the garden gate there is no other entrance if i find a snug corner as it rains 
i will remain there all day perhaps all night and to-morrow morning i shall be all right and ready to go to m rodolph's so i goes to the allee des veuves to place myself and what should i see but a small tavern not ten paces from your door i entered and took my seat near the window in a room on the ground floor i called for a quart of drink and a quart of nuts saying i expected some friends a humpbacked man and a tall woman i chose them because it would appear more natural i was very comfortably seated and kept my eye on the door it rained cats and dogs no one passed night came on but interrupted rodolph why did you not go at once to my house you told me to come the next morning monsieur rodolph and i didn't dare return there sooner i should have looked like an intruder a sneak brosseur as the troopers call it you understand well there i was at the window of the wine-shop cracking my nuts and drinking my liquor when through the fog i saw the chouette approach accompanied by bras rouge's brat little tortillard aha said i to myself now the farce begins well the little hound of a child hid himself in one of the ditches of the allee and was evidently on the lookout as for that blank the chouette she takes off her bonnet puts it into her pocket and rings the gate bell our poor friend m murphy opens the door and the one-eyed mother of mischief tosses up her arms and makes her way into the garden i could have kicked myself for not being able to make out what the chouette was up to at last out she comes puts on her bonnet says two words to tortillard who returns to his hole and then cuts her stick i say to myself caution no blunder now tortillard has come with the chouette then the schoolmaster and m rodolph are at bras rouge's the chouette has come out to reconnoitre about the house then sure as a gun they'll try it on this very night if they do m rodolph who believes they will not go to work till to-morrow is quite overreached and if he is overreached i ought to go to bras rouge's and see for him true but then suppose that the schoolmaster arrives in the meantime that's to be thought of suppose i go to the house and see m murphy mind your eye that urchin tortillard is near the door he will hear me ring the bell see me and give the word to the chouette and if she returns that will spoil all and the more particularly as perhaps m rodolph has after all made his arrangements for his evening confound it these yes and no bothered my brain tremendously i was quite bewildered and saw nothing clear before me i didn't know what to do for the best so i said i'll walk out and perhaps the clear air will brighten my thoughts a bit i went out and the open air cleared my brain so i took off my blouse and my neck handkerchief i went to the ditch where tortillard lay and taking the young devil's skin by the cuff of his neck how he did wriggle and twist and scuffle and scratch i put him into my blouse tied up one end with the sleeves and the bottom tightly with my cravat he could breathe very well well then i took the bundle under my arm and passing a low damp garden surrounded by a little wall i threw the brat tortillard into the midst of a cabbage bed he squeaked like a sucking pig but nobody could hear him two steps off i cut off it was time i climbed up one of the high trees in the allee just in front of your door and over the ditch in which tortillard had been stationed ten minutes afterwards i heard footsteps it was raining still and the night was very dark i listened it was the chouette tortillard tortillard says she in a low voice it rains and the little brat is tired of waiting said the schoolmaster swearing if i catch him i'll skin him alive fourline take care replied the chouette perhaps he has gone to warn us of something that has happened maybe some trap for us the young fellow would not make the attempt till ten o'clock that's the very reason replies the schoolmaster it is now only seven o'clock you saw the money nothing venture nothing have give me the ripping chisel and the jemmy what instruments are they asked rodolph they came from bras rouge's oh he has a well-furnished house in a crack the door is opened stay where you are 
said the schoolmaster to the chouette keep a bright lookout and give me the signal if you hear anything put your pinking iron in the buttonhole of your waistcoat that you may have it handy said the old hag the schoolmaster entered the garden and i instantly coming down from the tree fell on the chouette i silenced her with two blows of my fist my new style and she fell without a word i ran into the garden but thunder and lightning monsieur rodolph it was too late poor murphy he was struggling on the ground with the schoolmaster at the entrance and although wounded he held his voice and made no cry for help excellent man he is like a good dog bites but doesn't bark well i went bang heads or tails at it hitting the schoolmaster on the shoulder which was the only place i could at the moment touch vive la charte it's i the chourineur shouts m murphy ah villain where do you come from cries out the schoolmaster quite off his guard at that what's that to you says i fixing one of his legs between my knees and grasping his fin with my other hand it was that in which he held his dagger and m rodolph asked m murphy of me whilst doing all in his power to aid me worthy kind-hearted creature murmured rodolph in a tone of deep distress i know nothing of him says i this scoundrel perhaps has killed him and then i went with redoubled strength at the schoolmaster who tried to stick me with his larding pin but i lay with my breast on his arm and so he only had his fist at liberty you are then quite alone says i to m murphy whilst we still struggled desperately with the schoolmaster there are people close at hand he replied but they did not hear me cry out is it far off they would be here in ten minutes let us call out for help there are passers-by who will come and help us no as we have got him we must hold him here but i am growing weak i am wounded thunder and lightning then run and get assistance if you have strength left i will try and hold him m murphy then disengaged himself and i was alone with the schoolmaster i don't want to brag but my jove these were moments when i was not having a holiday we were half on the ground half on the bottom step of the flight i had my arms around the neck of the villain my cheek against his cheek and he was puffing like a bull i heard his teeth grind it was dark it rained pouring the lamp left in the passage lighted us a little i had twisted one of my legs round his but in spite of that his loins were so powerful that he moved himself and me on to the bare ground he tried to bite me but couldn't i never felt so strong thunder my heart beat but it was in the right place i said i am like a man who is grappling with a mad dog to prevent him from fastening on some passer-by let me go and i will do you no harm said the schoolmaster in an exhausted voice what a coward says i to him so then your pluck is in your strength so you wouldn't have stabbed the cattle dealer at poissy and robbed him if he had only been as strong as me eh no says he but i will kill you as i did him and saying that he made so violent a heave and gave so powerful a jerk with his legs at the same time that he half threw me over if i had not kept a tight hold of his wrist which held the stiletto i was done for at this moment my left hand was seized with a cramp and i was compelled to loosen my hold that nearly spoiled all and i said to myself i am now undermost and he at top he'll kill me never mind i had rather be in my place than his m rodolph said that i had heart and honour i felt it was all over with me and at that moment i saw the chouette standing close by us with her glaring eye and red shawl thunder and lightning i thought i had the nightmare finette cries the schoolmaster i have let fall the knife pick it up there there under him and strike him home in the back between the shoulders quick quick only wait only wait till i find it till i see it full in and then the cursed chouette turned and poked about us like an old bird of mischief as she was at last she found the dagger and sprung towards it but as i was flat on my belly i gave her a kick in the stomach which sent her neck over crop she got up and in a desperate rage i could do no more 
i still held on and struggled with the schoolmaster but he kept giving me such dreadful blows on my jaw that i was about to let go my hold when i saw three or four armed men who came down the stairs and m murphy pale as ashes and with difficulty supporting himself with the assistance of the doctor here they seized hold of the schoolmaster and the chouette and soon bound them hand and foot that was not all i still wanted m rodolph i sprang at the chouette remembering the tooth of the poor dear goualeuse i grasped her arm and twisted it saying where is m rodolph she bore it well and silently i took a second turn and then she screeched out at bras rouge's in the vault at the bleeding heart all right as i went i meant to take tortillard from his cabbage bed as it was on my road i looked for him but only found my blouse he had gnawed his way out with his teeth i reached the bleeding heart and i laid hold of bras rouge where is the young man who came here this evening with the schoolmaster don't squeeze so hard and i'll tell you they wanted to play him a trick and shut him up in my cellar we'll go now and let him out we went down but there was no one to be seen he must have gone out whilst my back was turned says bras rouge you see plain enough he is not here i was going away sad enough when by the light of the lantern i saw at the bottom of the cellar another door i ran towards it and opened the door and had as it were a pail of water thrown at me i saw your two poor arms in the air i fished you out and brought you here on my back as there was nobody at hand to get a coach that's all my tale m rodolph and i may say without bragging that i am satisfied with myself my man i owe my life to you it is a heavy debt but be assured i will pay it david will you go and learn how murphy is added rodolph and return again instantly the black went out where is the schoolmaster my good fellow in another room with the chouette you will send for the police m rodolph no you surely would not let him go ah m rodolph none of that nonsensical generosity i say again he is a mad dog let the passengers look out he will never bite again be assured then you are going to shut him up somewhere no in half an hour he will leave this house the schoolmaster yes without gendarme yes he will go out from here and free free and quite alone quite alone but he will go wherever he likes said rodolph interrupting the chourineur with a meaning smile the black returned well david well and how is murphy he sleeps my lord said the doctor despondingly his respiration is very difficult not out of danger his case is very critical my lord yet there is hope oh murphy vengeance vengeance exclaimed rodolph in a tone of concentrated rage then he added david a word and he whispered something in the ear of the black he started back do you hesitate said rodolph yet i have often suggested this idea to you the moment is come to put it into practice i do not hesitate my lord the suggestion is well worthy the consideration of the most elevated jurists for this punishment is at the same time terrible and yet fruitful for repentance in this case it is most applicable without enumerating the crimes which have accumulated to send this wretch to the bang for his life he has committed three murders the cattle dealer murphy and yourself it is in his case justice he will have before him an unlimited horizon for expiation added rodolph after a moment's silence he resumed and five thousand francs will suffice david amply my lord my good fellow said rodolph to the bewildered chourineur i have two words to say to m david will you go into that chamber on the other side where you will see a large red pocket-book on a bureau open it and take out five notes of a thousand francs each and bring them to me and inquired the chourineur involuntarily who are those five thousand francs for for the schoolmaster and do you at the same time tell them to bring him in here End of chapter 16